We are going to put the panels up. This is exactly the same as a timber frame house. These panels are produced in exactly the same way. They're pre-insulated. These ones are slightly different than I've done before. I've got gapo tape on the insulation as well. So they're even more efficient than really well cut insulated panels. They're really going to be absolutely brilliant. So we're going to start now. We've got the panels sorted into some sort of order. They're all numbered. I have a plan with the numbers on and we'll probably start in the far corner, work along, work back to this corner and then we'll come round. So where we've got window openings, we have to put glue lamb lintels across. So we'll come either side, pop the glue lamb lintels in and that enables us to connect it all together. So the key with putting these buildings up is get yourself organized, know where everything is, don't trap yourself with anything. Now we're gonna use some OSB as staging to work on. We're just gonna put those on the joists. Then we're gonna offer up the panels. We're gonna brace them in situ. I'll show you how I work my braces out and cut them using the traditional framing square. And that's it, we're gonna get on. So a traditional framing square such as this. There's so many things a carpenter can do with it. Now, this is my simplified metric roofing square, but it is also a typical framing square. Now, a lot of people say to me, what's a framing square for other than being able to check something for square? Well, that's something I don't really do with this, to be fair. I do it on small objects, but I wouldn't want to square something like this up. I'd always do that with the measure. So, what we can do, for example, before I stand these timber frame panels up, I'm gonna need a number of diagonal braces. These are temporary braces that I'll attach at the top onto the floor joists, which will hold them plumb or thereabouts until we get our head binder round, which is what sort of keeps all of those panels together and we fine tune it with levels and, and that sort of stuff. So I'm gonna put some OSB deck boards down to us to work on and walk on safely because we're not going to be putting the flooring in here until we've got the roof on to allow electrical cables and all sorts of other services to go through. So I like to take the framing square. I'm going to take, if I can try and draw this for you somewhere. So let's take our floor joist here, okay? This is the end of our building. Now we're going to stand a panel up here somewhere and it's going to be so, so big. So we're going to need a brace, which is going to attach that here, temporary and into the side of the joist to keep this plumb, okay? What we're also going to have is a couple of boards through here to work on. So we want to miss those as well. So I know that they're 600 or two foot wide. So I need to allow say 1400 across the floor and then I need to put this brace at a height, which is comfortable to screw. It's no good at it being too high and you've got to climb on something. So I'll probably set that at around about 2.1 meters. So this will be 2.1 meters. This will be 1.4 meters. And I can just do that straight off the square. It's really quite simple. Using the outside millimeter scale, I'll just offer this onto one of my braces here. And up the millimetre scale there, I'm going to go 2.1 here. And across the bottom, I'm going to go 1.4. So there we have 1.4, 2.1. All right. Put a mark, it's actually a plumb cut and a seat cut. And that is the angle of the brace, nice and steep, away from my flooring. I'm going to be attaching these on the studs not on the edges of the panel because the panels butt together. I'm going to put them on the studs. There's about 25 mil of stud showing before it hits the insulation. So I'll be adding on 25 millimeters is what I'm going to be fixing here. So that's where I'll actually cut this. Now let's just set this up with the fence so it's in the right angle. It can stay that way then. So my, this is one of my prototype fences. It's just some Lexan which is just like a clear perspex material, quite strong and some sapili. And so we can just set that up exact, in, in exactly the same way. Now we'll just line that up to that angle. And then obviously the plumb cut, we just tighten these out of the way. And that's it. So there's the top cut be actually there. Now we need to know the length.
quickly go into something here. This is the first time we've used the Gapo Tape product on a prefabricated build. So what we've got is pre-insulated from the manufacturer, a typical timber frame structure. So they cut all of their PAR super accurately and generally speaking, there's no gap, but there always is a gap. It's just how it is. So um, Paul, this is Paul from Gapo Tape. Hello. He's the man. And I've known Paul for like, <laughs> for about numbers. six years, the first yeah. time I met you and I was going, what is this stuff? Oh no, not another product, the rest of it. And it took a bit of convincing, but now, I won't use anything else, especially on refurb jobs, putting it between rafters and the rest of it. It's just a game changer. Yes, you have to buy it, so it's another product to buy, but the finished job really, really works. And so I think it's something, and the regs have changed now. Regs have changed, part L from, well, they, they changed in January this year, and they come into play January next year. However, you've got six months. So if your shovel's yeah. in the ground before yeah. June 2022, you can carry on ignoring the problem. But um, yeah, obviously, and, and, what, and what that problem is, Paul will correct me if I'm wrong, but basically we're trying to eliminate what we call the performance gap in the construction industry. Anyone who's seen this stuff put in, in a roof structure, or if you've tried to do it and you're not a genius with angles and bevels and all the rest of it, this stuff gets thrown in, it gets held with nails, someone puts a bit of foam Sorry, in. Man. And what you do, you go around with a thermal imaging camera afterwards and it is horrific. It's like a horror movie, isn't it? You just yeah. got... And, 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 and like I say, you used to be able to plasterboard over it before building control turned up. Yeah. And is it in? Yeah, of course it's in. So, but part of this Part L amendment as well, there's a new form of testing coming into play where we've got to test every unit. So we're going to start really seeing what the buildings are actually doing. So we're actually doing some really interesting work with the Building Performance Hub up in um, High Wycombe and Verifirm, the new sort of mm. thermal testing. And I was, you, know, you should come yeah. up one day when we're doing the sort of final testing. We're, so what we've done is we pre, there's a prefabricated unit with uh, branded insulation, um, 100 mil, and it's been installed what they would think correctly. Obviously there's tiny incremental gaps, which we've seen. So we've tested that, we've got a U value on it. We're gonna now gonna retrofit this project with Gapper Tape, rerun the exact same tests and basically prove a real on-site um, performance difference and eliminating that performance gap. So that's... And um, what, what I love about it is if you take a typical loft conversion and most of the properties in the UK used to have a 100 mil rafter, okay? So that means that with an airspace over the top, you've either got to build the roof down to achieve the U-values and go underneath, which is what we do anyway for thermal bridging. But by using Gapo tape on PIR, um, we've had instances where we, we can actually go from a 120 down to a 100 because it's been proven in the tests in the laboratory with the Gapo tape used properly, you're gonna get a better performance from a 100 mil PIR than you are from yeah. a 120, which reduces the cost. And at the moment, I reckon that the difference in cost would cover the cost of the Gapo tape. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy, you know? And, it, well, the, and the, there's things that you are taking out again, which is when you are, and a lot of people will be like, I don't need it, I'll just go attack it with a spray foam gun. And yeah. it's like, a lot of people are doing that and you're filling, let's say in essence, you know, the 100 mil PIR and you're spraying into this gap or spraying up round into the breather membrane. So you're running the risk of you know, doing yeah. harm. So um, insulation's performance is in its full depth. I should have had a model here. To nah, I you, I was going on camera. you can see the model but, um, on Skill Builder. Yeah, PIR and Gapper Tape is the only solution out there that's proven to eliminate this performance gap. And mm. that's the big thing. Mm. Um, you know, I mean... Mm. It is going to take years for all you guys out there in the domestic market, especially. It is going to take years yeah, before, before you, you know, get pushed into doing it. But it will come. The sooner you look at it, try it tell your customers that you know the roof is going to be done like this and we now need this tape give them the option if they say to you yeah. they don't want it the building inspectors got you they've got a problem with the building inspector it's not down to you and i think that's really key here is yeah. as a contractor as a carpenter as a roofer it's really important to know the regs it's, uh, part l but also there's uh, now you're going to catch me here because appendix is it, c is it annex no but annex oh. d part of it which is basically where the the developer this is new build though because obviously right. we're going to have um the you know, refurb works which will be a different game again but um yeah i think what i'll have to do is when robin does his edit get a little picture of what the mm. actual document is up there and show where you're going to have to start mm. showing photographic evidence of mm. how you've installed your board mm. and have you eliminated this performance gap mm. by using compressible tapes so um, yeah, there's, there's big change coming, mm. and like I say, it's that whole thing. You know, if it was my house, I'd use it, and I would say that, but however, you know, it's about building performance, and you want the actual products that you're using to actually work, rather than just throwing spec stuff mm. in and just hoping that it's going to sit in unison. Because as we know, timber doesn't tend to stay true. No. Um, 
goes all over the shop. Yeah, exactly that. So, and that's before you heat the building, and mm. then you're going to really get some settlement mm. issues and mm. a lot of movement. So, mm. yeah, I mean. So come and have a quick look at what we've done there, yeah, mate, sure, and then sure. we'll crack on and build the rest yeah, of it. I'll go. I'll yeah, I'll Yeah, yeah. So that's it. What do you reckon? No, so these guys turn up. You, you commissioned this guy to Yeah, yeah, they, they, they came, in, came in came yeah. in like that, yeah. With the tapes. It looks good though, doesn't it? I'll tell you, that's the thing, like, they really, like, <sighs> I'll, I'll give them credit. They've done a good job, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. It looks nice. And that's what, we, like, what we'll do, obviously, we'll speak to the Verifirm guys and see, get them down here and do mm. a real test at the mm. end. Could do, yeah, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Get value yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah and then, it'd be good, and yeah. Then, But it's a real, you know, yeah, yeah. working yeah. U value rather yeah. than a spec U value. That'd be interesting. Yeah, man, no, that's good. Floors in next. Yeah, we won't put the floor in until we've got the roof done and everything else, and then they can get the wiring in. We'll get the we'll get the insulation done just before we put the um, floorboards down. We get, well, we can do it actually. We can actually do it before. As soon as the yeah. roof's on, then we'll put the insulation because yeah, we don't want the gaffer tape to get too wet or anything like that. We want it to stay. Because well, well, obviously, because it won't leak, it will start peeling <sighs> if it was to rain. Yeah, I mean we've got a couple of days to get the roof on yet, so. When's come on, chop chop. I know. Thanks. Well, <laughs> we, well, this won't buy the baby a bonnet. Let's get our yeah, fingers out, boys. All right. Yeah. I'm at the stage now that we've erected all the walls. We've got our head beams in. This is all glue lamb beam. You know I use a lot of glue lamb. I try to design out as much steel as possible, especially in a timber frame building. You know, I mean, a lot of people just use steel. You should look at glue lamb because the cost against steel and what you have to do with steel afterwards from a fireproofing, boxing in, you know, a uh, cold bridging point of view, this is a lot better. Anyway, we are now putting our Eco Joyce roof on. If you haven't used an Eco Joyce before, it's a really clever system. I particularly like it. You can run your services through them. Um, they're super strong, but they do much greater spans than solid timber. So if you were doing this in solid timber, there's not actually a solid timber which will go from front to back economically because it's around about six meters. So that's quite a big span. So they're engineered to suit the span and the cords, we call the cord is the top and the bottom section of timber that you see, is generally wider and it's thinner depending on the span, depending on the depth, etc. But there are a few things you need to know about these. They're never totally straight. They're put between presses. It's still a raw material, timber that moves all over the shop. Now I've got to set them out. And as I said, they're pretty long. They sit on the wall at the back and they're top cord supported at the front. And this is all to do with my eave detail and my build up. So that's how I've sort of designed it. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make one rod and the reason I'll just get my plan that's dropped off, I'm gonna make a rod because I've designed this to be symmetrical, which means that, you probably won't see this, but I'll, I'll put something in the screenshot. Everything is the same from the center both ways. So once I've got a rod marked out for one section to the center, I can use it here, 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 and here by reversing the rod over. So I've set this out based on the drawing, so this batten represents my rod. That's the inside of the stud work. So I'll butt that on the back wall and I'll mark it. But on the back wall, I've got what we call a rim board. This is my rim board, so I'll mark the rim board. In the middle of the joist, we've got something called strong back. Strong back is instead of a nogging, you don't nog these out. And the strong back runs through this section here. So it runs all the way through and I'll mark all that up as well. So when I slide my strong back in, it's already marked to the rod. So all I've got to do is pull the timber straight and fix it with the nails into these sort of upright noggins that are put there. And also I'll, front, I'll set the front out <coughs> with the rod as well. It makes it super quick and super accurate. So I'm just measuring once and then just using the same rod. So I'm gonna mark those out now, all on the bench, the rim board, the strong back, and that eliminates another job up on the roof.
So this is my strong back and I'm just literally transferring all of the marks off the rod. I know it's all gonna be exactly the same then. And then we'll just square these across and down. It's just super quick like this. We can mark all of the timbers at the same time. The first job was to sail a couple of big doubles through. And the reason why we've got those is because we're gonna have an air conditioning unit set into the ceiling. So we're trimming it like we would for a, um, a lantern, for example. There is no lantern on here, but we're trimming out. So our AC unit can be recessed in dead central and give you a really nice climate in the room all year round. Now, what we're also doing is because we can safely build this roof by popping the joists on, attaching them um, from our, our temporary ladders and that sort of stuff. But then we've got a furring piece because it's a flat roof. But what I want to avoid doing is walking all over there trying to put furring pieces on because it's just uncomfortable, it's awkward. And also with furring pieces, I've got a double furring piece which means that they're cut in a pair, so you spin them over. They're fairly accurate, but not that accurate. So what we're doing here, if I just pan around, We've got our joists all laid out on the ground here and we've got them as they would be on the roof. We've put them together. Now Andy's got the furring pieces and what he's been doing is they're all, they're all a pair. He's been, because they're never exactly the same, take this one for example, where it's been ripped and this is its, this is, this is its partner if you like. It's, it's just a bit thicker. So what he's been doing is pulling that one along until it's flush marking that one and that's where he's taking the cut off and then they're absolutely perfect so then what he's going to do is get them all fixed on nice and straight here and that means that we just got to put the joists in space them correctly fix them well and that's done it's going to save so much time and aggravation um, and it's so much nicer working on the ground doing a job like this it's 10 times quicker but most of all it's a lot safer so we've put most of the eco joists in and you can see that at the back, you've got the rim board going through and that was all marked on the bench. Then the next section you see through here is what you call a strong back. That is effectively a row of noggins for eco joists or metal web joists. And again, we mark that on the bench to the rod exactly the same. So when we slid it in from the end, like in this way, then obviously all we had to do was pull our joists left and right and fix them, you put a pair of nails into the short 
noggin that it goes in between at the back. It's super solid once you add those in. And sometimes when you're putting these eco joists in, you think, blimey, they're a little bit bouncy or whatever. But as soon as you connect the strong back through and you do all the fixings that you're told to do, it is super solid. And then if you imagine, then you start deck boarding out over the top. And in our case, then we've got 120 of PIR as well. Actually, um, the way it's so evenly spread, it's hardly ever, I mean, at the moment, if I'm uh, working on them, I'm 70 odd kilos, but a 70 kilo point load on the middle of one of those joists is bound to want to deflect a little bit. But actually they're super strong when they're actually all put in as a system and all the, the deck boards are nicely attached to them eventually as well. So we've had a busy couple of days here, building this floor, erecting the walls, and working our way through this basic flat roof structure. As I said, we've put the furring pieces onto the joists on the ground. We were able to get them all nice and true, and that's really made a big difference, I think. I've got these ones to go in. So on this end, I've got to put a post in, and I've got some special Simpson um, dovetail fixings that go on the top of the post down there. Just ease it back here. If I show you, it's all routed out here. That'll take the fixing, it's a concealed fixing, and it's a nice job actually. And then those glue dams will sit in the pockets at the top of the walls there and there and come out. There's the post and beams all in position now with the connections hidden away really nicely behind here and here. And it's just such a nice, simple, strong, fixings they're absolutely fantastic perfect for glue lamb and there's no fixings on show even though hardly any of this will be seen it's really nice because if it was on the show you've got no metal dowels going through you've got no spline connectors or anything like that i was explaining how i was using my metric framing square to simply get the angles of my braces i was then going on to tell you about how i work the lengths out now unfortunately the battery or the camera decided to stop filming. I think this is sometimes because I'm using my mobile phone. If someone texts me sometimes, if I haven't got the flight mode on, it kills the recording. So that was a bit of a schoolboy error. It, and so it wasn't until I got back, looked at the footage and I thought, oh my God, I didn't have that piece about measuring it. But it's a super simple way of doing it. Now I can use my Square and my app by just finding out one of the angles and using my app to say, how long is the angle or is the diagonal length by putting in one of the measurements and one of the angles. But I didn't need to do that because on site, the very quick way of doing this is actually just taking a section of brace. So I know I wanna be, for my brace, 1.4 meters across to avoid, when we stand them up, to avoid a couple of sheets that we're working on on this floor. I also know I wanna be 2.1 meters tall so I'm just gonna measure that back this way, 2.1 meters onto this joist, because if you think about it, these are all nice and square, 2.1 meters here. So that effectively is the length of my brace from there to here. If I then need to measure that and transfer it, if I was on site and I had a few of these to do, I'd put these two points in here. I'd take a length of bracing, I'd whack it down on the floor, on my mark here, and then on my mark over here. I'd strike that off with a pencil, obviously from underneath. The same on the top. And there I have the brace angles and the length. I'll cut these out. Because I want them to go on the side, I effectively need to leave that bit on the front there. So I don't need to cut the top of that one. And the side, I want to go down the side of the joist, so I just need to move that over slightly. Let's get my square and the saw. I'll just transfer a little bit of that onto there. Just go like this. You can see it's exactly the same angle as what I demonstrated on the measure. It's just a bigger scale version of that. And I want it to cross 
onto the joist a little bit. So that's effectively where it fixes to the side of the joist. I'll just cut that off. Let me go around here. And then we have a brace which will fit. Let me just offer it in. It will sit on there and against there. And that's just the quickest and easiest way of finding the angle, the lengths and everything else. And then we'd go around as you saw, and these are held. All of this is held up by the braces until we've got the roof on, the cladding's on, it's all nice and square. So I hope you enjoyed that. So that concludes, I would say, the erection of the timber panels, the timber frame. We've got our roof on, it's looking lovely up there. The next job on this is gonna be putting down 22 mil P5 Egger Protect. It's a flooring that I use a hell of a lot. And I'm also gonna do, on that video, I'm gonna show you the actual method as set out by the manufacturer. There's a couple of methods of fixing them. We're gonna choose a particular method that they set out. And this is the one that's most recognized by say the NHBC, especially if you want a product guarantee and a warranty. Thanks for watching. Check back soon. I really enjoy having you watching these videos. It's sort of entertaining, all of the comments and everything else. And I'll see you soon.